May the 6th, 1937. In the skies over Manhattan, the airship Hindenburg is the largest craft to be flown, a symbol of German engineering and audacity. She waits for landing conditions to improve and for her disastrous fate, just a few short hours away. Well, here it comes, ladies and gentlemen, and what a great sight it is, a thrilling one. It's a marvelous sight, coming down out of the sky, pointed directly towards us and toward the mooring mass. These were the newsreel scenes of horrible catastrophe shown in cinemas around the world and the immortal broadcast of Herbert Morrison that wrenched the hearts of millions of radio listeners. These words and images from 1937 endure, a symbol of great achievements and dramatic failures. The 1930s see the rise of Germany from the ashes of the First World War. The Germans are intent on asserting their new technological superiority. The explosion of the Hindenburg would prove to be a chink in the armor of Aryan invincibility. Before the new Zeppelin comes into service, she and her illustrious predecessor, the Graf Zeppelin, fly over German cities. Those airships were foolproof. The people that flew them were also foolproof. They knew what the score was. They had been schooled to do their job. Ask me, how did we lose the Hindenburg? We lost the Hindenburg by a bloody thing called a bomb. The airship had a bomb timed to go off in the hangar at Lakehurst. But the ship was just a few hours late in landing. Instead of getting the hangar and the airship and probably one or two people, they got people in and on the ground. If a bomb was planted, then who were the saboteurs? And if, as some contend, Adolf Hitler planted a bomb, then why would he want to blow up a symbol of his country's and his own power? The two massive Zeppelins are an impressive sight. They seem to herald the triumphant future Hitler has promised. And as virtual flying propaganda machines, they're very efficient in gaining public support. There is another equally possible, if less intriguing, theory that the Hindenburg was destroyed by natural causes. But whatever the theories about her destruction, there's no disputing that her construction was a marvel of the age. Built by the German Zeppelin Company, she's 803 feet long, longer than the largest battleship. Work is personally supervised by Dr. Hugo Eckner, the inheritor of Count von Zeppelin's great dream of a lighter-than-air ship that can fly safely anywhere. It is built mostly of extremely light aluminium. 16 gas cells filled with hydrogen will provide the lifting power. Although hydrogen is dangerously flammable, the Hindenburg is the 129th Zeppelin built. Every precaution is taken. Interior ladders and catwalks are lined with rubber. The crew will wear felt shoes to guard against static electricity. The four engines operate without an ignition system. May the 7th, 1936. Now, with her flight tests at an end, the Hindenburg sets out on her inaugural journey to the United States. With Dr. Eckner himself in personal charge, she carries 40 crewmen and 50 passengers. The passengers were people of notoriety and, and that uh, in those days uh, could uh, well afford the two and a half day trip from Frederickshafen to Lakehurst. Uh, it was uh, undoubtedly a scenic, uh, quite a scenic view, 
uh, there was an observation deck on either side of the airship. Their cabin and berths were along the interior in the center section of the airship, and the meals were sumptuous. As a matter of fact, I was acquainted with one of the cabin boys that was on board. The, the entire trip was a thing of luxury and, and real pleasure. You could, uh, they told me, as you're coming across the ocean, uh, in the early spring, you saw icebergs drifting. You could see uh, schools of whales and so forth. Uh, and from that position, very seldom did they fly above a thousand feet. Uh, you had a, an ideal observation deck. The Pope himself has allowed mass to be said aboard since the flight is so smooth that there's no danger of spilling the sacramental wine. Most luxuries familiar on the ground go aloft with the Hindenburg. One luxury not allowed is smoking, except in one insulated room. She carries airmail too, and her letters get a special Hindenburg postmark. The passage from Germany to her American port at Lakehurst in New Jersey takes 65 hours. The US Navy's airship station at Lakehurst is a short distance from New York City. The German Zeppelin companies made arrangements with the Navy to use the facilities. The hangar, the world's largest, still exists today. The airship, the Hindenburg, was 804 feet long. And an object that size, as it is flown down to within a reasonable distance of the ground, then the forward landing lines, two landing lines, come out from the bow. Uh, at that time, the trim on the balance of the airship is quite technical. Uh, they would, and they did in some pictures, as you would see, uh, release water ballast, because if she's coming down too fast, they will lighten it and so forth and trim it. Uh, once the lines and the ground crew are situated all along the entire length of the ship, all the way back to the tail, and they, they actually grasp it at the last moment around the control car, there are hand grips, and they bring it right on down until it is moored, the nose cone, to the mooring mast, and then it's stable. In America, this latest spectacle of the air age is greeted with excitement and awe. Dr. Eckner is jubilant. We had a very successful flight, I admit, under favorable weather conditions. But I am convinced under all weather conditions, even on the most unfavorable, we will, we will, will be able to make the flight in all regularity and safety. Thank you. Under all weather conditions, no one in 1936 would argue with Dr. Eckner's assessment of the new ship's flying capabilities. The Zeppelin is riding a wave of popularity, augmented by highly visible promotional flights across the East Coast. However, weather conditions and other forces would play a significant role in the tragedy that lay ahead for the Hindenburg. <laughs> Back at Lakehurst, John Iannacone, a ground crewman at the time of the Hindenburg. We took a lot of precautions here when, uh, when the, uh, the ship came here because we put the Hindenburg in the hangar the first time it arrived here in 1936. And uh, they made sure that all the uh, electrical leads and everything else was uh, fireproof and, and they were safe so that uh, nothing, uh, uh, nothing could cause a spark. This hangar was spark proof and they made sure that uh, nobody came in here with, uh, with any cigarettes, smoking or anything like that. The people that uh, were around the hydrogen ship knew what, what, uh, how dangerous it was, and they took a lot of precautions on it. And the Germans especially, they, they knew how to handle it. Yet in spite of all the care taken by her crew, both by the Germans on board and the Americans on the ground, something went terribly wrong. Many believe it was sabotage. Iana Cohn maintains it was more likely a combination of natural and man-made causes. First thing that was wrong with the Hindenburg was full of hydrogen. And uh, any time you get a spark, I mean, it's going to go. And uh, that's what uh, I think happened there. They, they left, left uh, valve some of the hydrogen out. And when the, uh, the ship got grounded, a spark happened somewhere, and there, there was free gas in there somewhere, and it caught on fire. 
In trying to understand how the disaster occurred, we need to retrace the final voyage of the Hindenburg from its beginning in Frankfurt on the 3rd of May, 1937. The Hindenburg, now enlarged to carry more passengers, prepares for her first transatlantic flight of the new season. In Frankfurt, she takes on 36 passengers. With the aid of an army of ground crew, in addition to the 61 crewmen on board, the Hindenburg is sent aloft, never to return. When bad weather is spotted on the first day, the officers reassure passengers that even if they were to sustain a direct hit by lightning, the seven million cubic feet of hydrogen used to keep the huge ship aloft would be in no danger. Prudently, however, they decide to head north to avoid the storm. The Hindenburg crosses the ocean at a top speed of 84 miles an hour, powered by her four Mercedes-Benz diesel engines. Before the dawn of transatlantic aircraft services, this is the quickest way to travel between Europe and America. On the second morning, land is spotted. Strong headwinds have made the ship several hours late, but bad weather ahead forces further delay. The passengers and crew gaze as they drift over New York City. The great looming airship is itself a spectacle, balanced on the cusp of what is most new, but as fate would have it, what is soon to be a part of history. It is four in the afternoon when the Hindenburg finally comes in sight of the landing area at Lakehurst, but severe storm clouds prevent immediate landing. At 5.43, Lakehurst advises that conditions are still unsettled. But at 10 past seven, the naval station advises the Hindenburg that the conditions have improved enough for landing. Captain Max Proust acknowledges and begins his approach. This is the spot where the control car of the Hindenburg hit the ground after she caught on fire. She came in from the north, northern part of the station here and headed, and headed for the mooring mast, which was down here at about uh, eight or 900 feet from here. And the ground crew was waiting for them to drop their lines and the cable. And just as soon as they got, got, got a hold of the lines and the cable, that's when the ship caught on fire. They burst into flames. Get this started, get this started. It's crazy, and it's crazy. It's crashing terrible. Oh, my, get out of the way, please. It's burning, bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning fast, and all the folks agree that this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's beautiful. It's funny. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the morning mass. All the humanity and all the fans screaming around me. I don't do it. I can't really talk to people. The fans are out there. It's a, it's, it's a, oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honest, it's just like they're a massive smoking wreckage. And everybody can't hardly breathe the talk and screaming. Lady, I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I'm going to step inside where I cannot see it. Charlie, that's terrible. The fire only lasted about 34 seconds, and, uh, and most of the uh, flames went up, and the uh, people that got, got uh, burnt the most were the, were the crew that were at the landing stations. They were inside the ship, and they couldn't, they couldn't get away from the, uh, the flames. But the passengers were on the bottom, and as, as you know, hydrogen goes up when it, uh, when it gets released. And so the fire just went right up, well, right on up to the top of the ship. I saw one of the uh, passengers, a young girl. She was uh, about 14 years 